So, okay. Um, welcome, everybody, and welcome back, everybody. It's, uh, we would like to continue our panels today with the second one. Uh, this one is titled Piles of Files, the Infinite Archive. And uh, I've got three guests here I would like to briefly introduce again, and afterwards they are going to present to you their presentations and the same procedure as last time. We have the discussion afterwards. So right next to me um, is Elodie Roy. Uh, Elodie is a um, media and material cultural scientist from the University of U Newcastle. Uh, next to Elodie is Simon Reynolds, um, author and music journalist. You will know him by from Retromania or Energy Flash or Rip It Up and Start Again, his books. And next to Simon is Pelis Nikas. He's a professor of media and communication studies from the Umeå University. Welcome, everybody, to our panel. Um, Piles of Files, uh, which is about um, one step further. In the, in the first uh, panel, we discussed um, 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 actually what is in archives and how who decides what goes into the archive and what does not go into the archive. This one is then maybe a panel about what do does these uh, what do these archives do with you or what do, how do they change you so i would like to ask you to start uh, simon would be the first presenter today and afterwards would be elodie and then pelle and then we start the discussion uh, hello good afternoon uh, thank you thank you for coming um so i guess uh to st state uh the obvious, uh, we, we, we're talking about, um, you know, the massive explosive expansion of the archive in the digital era. And, and really, I think from roughly the year 2000 to about 2008, uh, you had uh, broadband becoming a really widespread thing, growth of file sharing, YouTube, streaming really taking off. Um, it just, uh, you know, uh, a relationship with the past and accessibility to the past that had never really been conceivable uh, before. And, um, and it's just kept on e expanding. Um, and it's, you know, uh, it's had a lot of impact on music and music consumption, but many other forms of art, entertainment, and life, you know, st staggering kind of consequences. Um, and that, that, you know, that is one of the main things that informed me writing this book, Retromania. Uh, and I think what, you know, causes the mania in Retromania is, is this feeling of this enormous universe of the past that you kind of, you want to explore and, and you just kind of get uh, lost in it. Um, so one of the things that uh, I'm interested in, I suppose, um, you could call it like the phenomenology of digital life uh, in general and also specifically in terms of music, list, uh, music consumption, the kind of affects um, that, it, that this sort of these conditions have created, uh, even its effects on mental health, I think, are actually sort of relevant. <laughs> um, so um, about, uh, I think it was 1995, uh, Jacques Derrida, uh, Jacques Derrida, I think is the right way of saying it, uh, published this, this sort of um, slim uh, but very dense book called, in French, Mal d'Archive. Um, I read it for Retromania uh, and found it really not very helpful at all. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, he mentions email briefly, uh, uh, but it actually it's mostly a about Freud and about Jewishness and uh, a whole bunch of other things. Circumcision comes up more than email, doesn't it, uh, or the internet. But, you know, I, I just love, um, uh, I just love this, how it's translated into English, uh, which is archive fever. Um, just, just that phrase alone was enough, really, for me. And, it, and it's all, I almost feel like it's like a little poem. It has this kind of... Uh, Evocativeness. Um, I don't know how it was translated. How, how would you pronounce it in German if it was translated? Archive fever. Archive fever. All right. Um, so uh, I f it feels like it's you know that 
phrase, archive fever, archive fe fever, um, it just sort of captures how a lot of us, uh, you know, especially those of us who are sort of culture workers, uh, how we're living our lives these days, you know. Um, it's this kind of sort of mania, the mania is the word, mania for cataloging and collecting and making lists and document documenting both things and ourselves uh, and commemorating, you know, every possible point you could commemorate, some kind of previous release of a record or an event in music or many other things, people will commemorate it. There's a profusion of oral histories that are in incredibly intricate uh, accounts of things. Um, and so, um, it, you know, the, the, the total recall and the, the instant recall enabled by search engines and Wi-Fi means that, you know, it's, it's, it's really... Um, it's really right there, you know, we can sort of go into the past to some extent uh, instantly. Um, and um, as a result, you have all these, uh, you know, you have sort of commercial things that uh, are like archives in a sense, like Spotify and Netflix. You have uh, the public institutional ones like, um, you know, I think the British Library in, in, in England, um, recently made available like, I don't know, 100,000 uh, field recordings, just put them up there. Other people have done like, other institutions have put up like uh, thousands of hours of bird songs, you know. And I always bookmark these things, you know, never go back to them. Uh, but I always think, you know, one of these days I'll have a few hours to listen to these Australian birds. <laughs> um, uh, and um, then you have the open access things, the, the ones that enlist and invite amateur archivists to contribute to them. So YouTube, um, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Discogs. Um, there's this sort of infinite recessive profusion and confusion of, of, of archives. Um, each of them is, is, is sort of somewhere between a, a library and a labyrinth. And you could, you could get lost in one of them, any one of them for a lifetime. Um, and uh, I think of, you know, archive fever and retromania as not, uh, not interchangeable, but very closely related concepts. And you might almost say that if you, if you catch the retrovirus, you will come down with archive fever. And I, I suffer from it. You know, I'm, I, I'm a, I feel I'm a sickly, wilted kind of being. My memory is shot. My ar at the end of every day, my arms and fingers are aching for this sort of racing back and forth across the internet which is, you know, uh, kind of spatialized history. Uh, um, an archive is, is a sort of, uh, uh, yeah, it's like a, a subdivided space, isn't it, where, where, um, where you can sort of get to things that you need to get to. And that, that's all been put inside uh, the internet. And um, there's almost a kind of temporal whiplash as I kind of oscillate between all these, all these different pockets of the past. And... Uh, in any, in, a, in any given day, I, um, you know, I'll visit many eras and I'll sample many treasures. Uh, but I do it in a way that, um, I don't know if you have this expression in German, uh, people talk about checklist tourism, where you, like, you, you kind of do a city in a day or something like that. And, I, and so at the end of it, um, I, you know, I can barely retain any kind of after images from the, the musical museums and the sonic monuments that I've visited. I've tried to cram too much in. I don't want to miss out on anything, so I end up just barely experience, experiencing everything. Um, so, uh, and it's a point, this is a point at which I could say that, you know, retromania, uh, although it critiques a lot of things, it's also in some ways a, a kind of self-critique, you know, uh, from someone who is caught up in its processes. Um, and I feel, you know, one of the things about these days of being on the internet is that at the end of them, uh, you can often not recall what you, where you've been and what you've listened to and, and what you've done. Um, and it also, um, I think they kind of, uh, I think it, what it, the effect of, of these sort of online archives of music is that music is, is severed from its uh, role as a kind of memory maker. So, for instance, I can remember 
I can remember specific occasions when I bought records. You know, I can remember uh, the excitement of discovering something or the nervousness of, of you know, not a time not having hardly any money and just the decision, the weight of a decision of buying a record uh, always made me kind of f feel faint as I approached the counter with my choice. But I can't remember, you know, I don't think I can ever remember a single act of acquiring a piece of music off the internet. Um, so even that sort of, those sort of memories of being, you know, the, the eroticized music consumption uh, are kind of destroyed um, in these conditions. Um, I think, you know, I, I think probably young, much younger people than me do better with all this because they've, they've, you know, never known anything else. And they, they don't probably have uh, the same sort of um, obsessive uh, desire to still own things. So uh, it's people who remember what it was like when you know music was scarce and you had to pay for it, who still are stuck in this sort of mentality of downloading MP3s and uh, stuff. Pe people like my kids just kind of... Um, Maybe bookmark certain things, but they don't. They don't sort of want, need to have it. My son is crazy about music, but he doesn't. I don't think he owns a single MP3, although he does interestingly own four vinyl albums that he paid a fortune for that he's never played. They're just sort of sitting on the, on the <laughs> in his bedroom. Uh, um, so um, and they were trap albums as well. And they, it seemed very inappropriate to have a vinyl version of a, of a Travis Scott album. But um, uh, what was I going to say next? Um, yeah, so, you know, it's... it's uh, I think I've, I should probably skip some of this. I've already spoken for quite a while. <laughs> um, Yeah, so you know, there's someone like me, some, you know, someone who remembers the analog time. You know, I, I have, you know, like a, probably a lot of people here, I have like a external hard drive that has like years of music. I mean, you know, way more music than I could ever hope to listen to in the rest of my time being alive. Um, and what what I think happens is, um, you know, you you start you get addicted to the the, the feeling of acquisition. It's a little bit like when people used to talk about consumerism. They talk about the act of consuming is the purchase of the moment. Well, there's no money involved, but there's still a kind of faint libidinal buzz from this moment when you acquire something through downloading it. But even as you're downloading it, you're already searching for the next thing you're going to get. And um, a, a guy who is involved in um, creating a, a very amazing ar archive uh, on the internet, uh, UbuWeb, this guy, Kenneth Goldsmith, I think he's the main person behind it. Uh, he's a sort of uh, kind of literary critic and, and um, uh, a, a experimental writer, a uh, very interesting guy. He wrote a very interesting piece about how, uh, for The Wire some years ago, about how uh, most of the, you know, a lot of the things that he's a, he has personally gathered and put on Uber, Uberweb, he's never actually... Um, listen to or watched. It's like, it's an archive of the avant-garde, so it has experimental films, texts, quite a lot of sound art and, and weird music. Um, he just, you know, he, he's talked about how it, it, you just get addicted to the, the, the acquiring of it and the hunting for it and the actual experiencing of it sort of becomes almost irrelevant. Um, so, uh, one, you know, I'm talking here about uh, what you could call in Freudian terms the, the anal retentive aspects of music consumption in this age where you still have this sort of scarcity model or psychology and you're still trying to own them in some vestigial way. What e equally fascinates me is what you could call the, um, the anal expulsive tendency, which is uh, all these people out there who are compulsively sharing and uploading uh, and building these these you know these um, unofficial amateur websites and and dis discographical sort of pl places on the internet. Um, and there's something there is something maniacal. There's something deranged about these sort of manic sprees of of, of generosity. Um, and uh, but I've I've felt it too myself. You know I've 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 
I, I vastly more a sort of taker from the internet than, than a giver, but I have felt this sort of kind of ar amateur archivist sharing kind of impulse when uh, I have a few things that are fairly unique, like I have all these pirate radio tapes uh, from the 90s and, and uh, from, from London, you know, early jungle and stuff like that. And a few of them might actually be the only copy anyone made uh, of these shows. So I felt like this feeling of duty that I must put them up, digitize them, put them on YouTube, and, you know, garner 323 listens or whatever, <laughs> really pathetic uh, thing. But, and, that, you know, you sort of feel vaguely virtuous, like you're sort of contributing to this co commons. Uh, and, uh, but there's also a kind of, neuro a kind of neuro neurotic completism as well. You're kind of rectifying the sins of omission. You're filling in these gaps in the historical record. Um, so, uh, in terms of how all this music archiving affects music itself, um, I think there's there's two uh, main areas. Uh, one is the you know the listening experience of, of fans, and then the other is the mentality of musicians. And so, with fans, I, th I think music fans have actually become a lot, a lot kind of. In, they're kind of in the same predicament in a way, or the same st uh, confused state, uh, mixed blessing state where it's, there's good and bad about it. That, that before only critics and, and DJs used to have, and, and very extremely wealthy people, which was just having too much music. You know, in the case of DJs and critics being sent it back in uh, analog days, um, and uh, I get the sense, but uh, actually looking from how my son consumes music. Is, is, is that there's this, this you know, there's a, a very frantic processing of things and trying to listen to everything. Uh, and so you start doing what critics and DJs do, which is listen to things uh, once or just even partially. Uh, or you listen to things while you're doing other things. Um, and, uh, and that's very easy to do because, the, uh, you know, computers, computers and phones almost force you to do other things. You know, they, they, it's irresistible to write emails, read uh, newspapers, uh, go on Facebook while listening to music. And that's not a very good way to listen to music. So there's a kind of thinning of musical experience, I think. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, another way that I've seen people dealing with um, this sort of overload of, of music, uh, uh, certain bloggers that I, I know have, have done these things where they set themselves task, they try and go back into this more immersive mode. So they'll do something where they, they, they had a, have one blogger had a project where they listened to only one album for a whole week. That, that was the only music they allowed themselves. And it was to try and deepen this, go back to sort of kind of how it was when you were like a teenager and you only owned five albums maybe and you got something and you just played it over and over again. Uh, another way is to sort of do a whole artist's oeuvre in one go, which is something that I've found I do myself with Spotify where uh, I will create an enormous playlist and then never listen to it. So I have like, I have uh, probably about 80 Spotify playlists that I literally never listened to. I just assemble them and I think it's like a kind of, um, I think it's a sort of primitive psychological way of feeling in control because, you know, it's pretty fucking daunting Spotify, just the sheer amount of things you can listen to. Um, I'll just whiz through this very quickly. Um, have I reached ten minutes yet? All right, <laughs> sorry. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just I'll just stop there. Maybe the rest of it will come up uh, later on. Uh, over to okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. There is perhaps no better suited place than Berlin to turn or return to the sound archive. The Berlin Phonogram Archive, the world's second ever sound archive after the one in Vienna, was created in 1900. The other Berlin sound archive, the Lot Archive, was founded almost exactly one century ago and constituted an ambivalent archival project. At the Half Moon Camp in the south of Berlin, Thousands of prisoners of war were recorded during the First World War. They were forced to speak 
and sometimes sing into the diaphragm of the phonograph. Their voices, captured on shellac records, now form the core of one of our earliest stand archives. Thus, prisoners were twice imprisoned. First in the camp, secondly on record. But their stay in the camp was temporary, while their phonographic captivity would potentially last forever. At the beginning of the 20th century, many sound archives metaphorically captured the voice of the cultural other, the voice of difference. The early archive was also an instrument of scientific knowledge or pseudo-knowledge. It belonged to the male scientists, the teachers, the linguists, who sought to explain and organize the world. Early sound archives were thus haunted by a dream of control, a dream of total knowledge, authority, and power. At the same time, they were also inhabited with a fantasy of immortality, of eternal preservation. Along with photographs, the record was one of the most extraordinary archival media of the 19th century. The new technology of phonography changed the nature of memory itself, radically changing people's relationships to themselves and to the past. Phonography, alongside photography, anticipated a new kind of memory culture, where the images and the sounds of the past could be played and in the present. To some extent, we are the direct inheritors of this Victorian um, culture of the trace. Of course, early sound archives are very different from contemporary digital archives, and then so have very different purposes. And yet, we may argue, along with Taylor, that the phonographic realm anticipated the digital realm. For Taylor, digitization accomplishes many of the same things as a gramophone. Music storage and retrieval is greatly facilitated. So this time it is not simply music as sounds, but music as bits, combinations of zeros and ones. What kind of relationship do digital archives bear to these early sound archives? What kind of ghosts are there in our digital machines? I do not intend to abruptly compare the archives that was to the digital sound archive of today. Yet I believe that there are bridges between them and intermittent points of contact. So today I would like to present um, a few impressions or notes in order to consider the sound archive um, in the digital age. As we've seen, the early sound archive was a site of centralized power. It created a sphere of exclusion and exclusivity. On the contrary, today's, on, to, today's online archives rely on a logic of visibility or hypervisibility exchange and open access. The British Library, for instance, is still digitizing its entire sound collection of five million unique recordings. The library encourages users to, re to use, remix and disseminate the digital files. With digitization, we have left the old model of the fortress of the archive as described by Alain René in his short film, All the Memory in the World, to enter the open archive. As we do so, we move from archival centralization to archives without centers. The internet has allowed for a crucial deprofessionalization, decentralization, and deconstruction of memory work. There is no longer one single keeper of the archive. As well as authoritative figures, we have DIY archivists and spontaneous curators and MP3 bloggers. In the UK, one such user-generated archival project is the Women's Liberation Music Archive, launched in 2011. 
through decentralized collecting practices, DIY and online archives introduce a change in the production and dissemination of knowledge, re-inscribing the marginal within cultural memory. In his 1971 novel, The Abortion, Richard Brotigan imagined a library of errors, a constellation of randomly organized, minor, amateur, and forgotten works. DIY archives and archives of the margin remind me of Brotigan's library. The shape of these archives is fluctuant and reversible. Indeed, the digital archive is characterized by its elasticity. Certainly, the archival tower of Edwin Morgan's poem, with its neat vertical organization, has long collapsed. The digital archive becomes, rather, something much more horizontal, enveloping, more like a wasteland. Rather than a single point of origin, it may provide us with an infinity of possible becomings. Everything which is recorded constitutes a potential archival trace. Everything can be deemed worth preserving. At the same time, memory scholars such as Stiegler and Wissen have warned us that too many memory traces may only lead to an amnesia. In this regard, we may have moved from the hard archive to the soft or liquid archive, to the archive as a, pla as a place of passing. The internet can be said to re reinforce an economy of distraction. It distracts us, first as a pleasurable entertainment, then perhaps as a kind of soft intoxication or a diversion, taking us away from ourselves and the present. It encourages not focus, but a kind of paradoxical accelerated flannery or drift. The availability of content creates a disorientation, a sense of dispersion. We have become digital drifters. The online infinite archive provides a form of infinite distraction, to reuse Dominic Petman's words. The archive of YouTube, for instance, grows with each passing second, but this speed is not commensurate with our limited human time. The more there is, the less we will be able to access it, let alone remember it. In many ways, digitization makes recording of the past new again. It also allows us to excavate and share buried treasures, as such, it allows for a broader recommercialization and consumption of memory to take place. There is a clear relation between the digital boom and the increase in archival ratio labels. What we call the archive today is less here to preserve the past than to serve the present, partially gratifying our ceaseless love of the new. In archival sounds, we may listen for new sensations and aesthetic thrills, searching for the never, never heard before. As such, the digital archive could be seen as a site of presence and immediacy rather than of representation. The, web the website uh, Radio, as we've mentioned it before, launched in 2013, for instance, invites users to upload recordings from all over the world. Listeners selecting a continent and a decade can semi-randomly play the archive as one hears the radio. What we have is a performance of the archive, a performance which always takes us back to the present and where the past has become, in some ways, um, a destination. There is a tension between the archiving potentialities of the Internet and its permanently changing structure. 
The architecture of digital archives is precarious and ephemeral. It relies on a complex yet fragile infrastructure and impermanent third-party companies. Servers and data banks won't be here forever. And for instance, uh, MySpace has just taken down its, um, all of its contents. And YouTube, um, and another example is YouTube. YouTube is a commercial platform which has no obligation towards data preservation. It was never intended as a public archive. It may be said, then, that the digital file is a temporary storage format, which is better suited for the consumption of music than for its preservation. As previously mentioned, the digital archive exists in the age of high transience, but it may also, paradoxically, produce this very transience. What we may ultimately have, then, is an archive of light and an archive of speed, one which is forever disappearing. So thank you, these were a few um, of my impressions and I'm sure we can develop them in the, in the discussions. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, I will be a bit brief um, <clears throat> and um, have, I have basically three uh, uh, introductory tracks, um, the, per the personal, the institutional and the commercial. And <clears throat> the personal would, might perhaps be um, spelled out as, quote, how I lost track of my own music. Unquote. And it's a bit about like the story that you told. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm a Swedish media scholar, 47 years of old uh, age, so I've been around for a while and uh, also remember the, the experience of buying the LPs on vinyl, etc. in the 80s, then uh, moving over to buying CDs. Um, then during the 90s, of course, you had the, the CD burners that you were sharing among friends, um, which was then developed over into the kind of Napster moment, uh, which was then ex exactly 20 years ago. Uh, I was a PhD student at the time at Stockholm University, and me and a friend went there on, on weekends to use all the department's computers, just downloading stuff on them. <laughs> yeah, fond memory. Um, and a after that, of course, uh, was the launch a couple of years later of Apple's iTunes, and, and um, I started buying um, uh, MP3 songs. So I'm, I'm mostly talking about popular music, but as as the music during the late 90s and around the millennium became dematerialized, I, I, I and, and became files in that sense. I also sort of lost track of them, and I think that's that's an experience that quite a number of us share here, which for for an early or a later generation is not the case. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so that was the first one. The second track is how institutional music archives became increasingly empty. So I have a background working uh, a number of years, almost a decade, within the Swedish heritage sector. I was uh, head of research at the Swedish National Media Archive for a number of years and then moved over to the Swedish National Library. So I've been sort of on the, on the part of the institutional side regarding uh, uh, the preservation of heritage. Uh, in Sweden, there is a legal deposit law since 1978, for also for audiovisual material. So not only are books uh, kept uh, and printed matters, but also uh, all audiovisual stuff. And the legal deposit law for music uh, worked really well. So all the LPs and CDs that came out on the Swedish market were archived. They, they got metadata in, at, at this institution. Uh, this works really well until, um, again, the Napster moment or the um, iTunes um, uh, launch of the Apple iTunes. And then, of course, uh, the, the launch of the streaming services. I mean, how do you archive an archive as Spotify if you consider it to be an archive? So, in a way, the kind of the institutional uh, archives have... Um, they're not, you know, they're not empty, but they have sort of resigned from the role of, of keeping, in this uh, case, the, the um, uh, popular music. 
which is, of course, a problem. And, and given the discussion here about uh, the notion of the archive, I think, it's, I think we need a new, uh, a new term. It's not really apt. I think uh, here in, in Be Berlin, um, Wolfgang Ernst, the media archaeologist, has said, stated that you need to archive the concept of the archive, which I, I think is, is quite apt. Um, okay, so the, so the final track then, uh, com the, the commercial one. Well, I've been for a number of years heading up a, a quite large research project called Streaming Heritage, very apt for the occasion, around Spotify. So as you all know, Spotify is, a, or is said to be a Swedish company, uh, which is now the largest music service uh, uh, provider. Um, the, the start of this project was actually, uh, the idea came, came to me when I was still working at the National uh, Swedish uh, Library. Uh, and the way that uh, streaming services, not only Spotify, but also YouTube, etc., provided much better access to audiovisual material than these old institutions, basically because of copyright restrictions. So how, how did this change the kind of relation to, to uh, the way you could access heritage? Um, and another imp important background was when, when Spotify was being uh, launched, the CEO, Daniel Eek, uh, repeatedly stressed the importance of back catalog. So again, they were, they were not using the term of the archive, but they were thinking about their service in terms of an archival service uh, without that notion. And of course, they've been really successful in that sense, making old mostly then popular music, uh, getting this kind of revival, moving into the, the kind of retromania uh, um, uh, discourse that you've been writing about, uh, which I think is, is, is an important trait of these uh, uh, music service providers, that they have this kind of archival side to them. Uh, on the other hand, there is also a course of question of you know, what, what kind of music is actually on these uh, um, streaming service providers such as Spotify. In our research project, we've been experimenting with various bots that are that is small software programs. Um, on the one hand, to sort of um, try to analyze the kind of the, the algorithmic structure, and we could perhaps get back to that. But on the other hand, also try to question where the uh, limit for what is considered to be music or not is is has been tested. So, of course, as you all know, music on Spotify and other ag uh, services are, are aggregated. And uh, it, 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 in fact, depends on... If, if you record, as my PhD or my doctoral student did, um, her um, breakfast sounds and then put on some music to them, some aggregators would say that this is not music, we cannot accept this. But whether if she would pay a small amount of money, then, then it would pass. So you would then, of course, have on the streaming services a number of kind of strange zombie music, which no one really listens to. And there is, as some of you know, also the site Forgotify, uh, where you can um, click, go, go into it and then listen to songs that no one has ever heard on Spotify. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, to open the discussion, um, I would like to ask all of you an initial question. And um, this uh, panel is titled, titled Piles of Files. That in me evokes a threatening picture. You know, it's just these, I mean, files are of course not a physical thing, but these are these huge piles of stuff that threaten to fall down on me and just kill me. So um, what would you say um, with, these, with, these, uh, with this endless piling up of material in digital forms, how does this change us? And how does this also change the production and perception of music? Or maybe the other way around. How does it change the perce production perception of music and in the end change us? Just, there are microphones available there. Uh, well, I think, I think it's awful. This is my own personal experience. I mean, I, um, I mean there are great things, you know, there, um, there are great things about these sort of unofficial archives, particularly things like YouTube where you can, you know, see all these old TV programs you watched when you were a kid, or actually go, you can actually go back to a period, um, so, like for instance, uh, I was very involved in the rave scene in, in London in the early days of Jungle, um, 
but I was limited by the fact that, um, you know, I was listening to all these pirate radio stations, but, you know, I lived in a particular area, so I could only hear some of them, uh, and, I, and I only had one radio. It never occurred to me, I don't know why. I was so obsessed with the music, it never occurred to me to buy some extra radios and then tape, diff you know, multiple show, multiple st pirate stations at the same time. And I wish I had. But now you could actually, you know, I can go and listen to bits of Lon parts of London I didn't live in, because a lot of them only, stations only reach certain parts of uh, London, and I could listen to shows I missed, and I could actually live my whole life in 1992 and 93, uh, just listening to this emerging sound, you know, that moment of emergence. Uh, um, I w you know, you couldn't recreate, you w because I know what happened next and all the things it evolved to, I wouldn't have exactly that feeling of, of uh, that I had at the time of what the hell is happening with this music and where is it going. But you know, I could, you could live in a whole period of the past. So, the, um, but it's it's cool to do things like that or to listen, you know. But generally speaking, I just feel absolutely oppressed by it and lost in it. And um, and um, um, for a while on my blog, I actually had the slogan under my blog was um, "Very far from grace," <laughs> uh, which you could take in the Christian sense, but it also kind of means like. Um, it's similar to what when people talk about mindfulness. I feel like I'm a very far from being a mindful person, and, and I'm like lost in lost in these archives. And uh, uh, and the, fun, oh, the funny thing, I didn't read it from the from the thing I prepared, but um, of course N Nietzsche talked about all this in uh, the uses and uh, abuses of history, and he he is way long before Spotify or YouTube. He's going on about uh, the uh, people. Uh, buried in mounds of historical detritus. And that's, I kind of, that's kind of how I feel I am. <laughs> um, but it, so it could also be to do with my age. I'm, I think I'm particularly, being the age I am, I'm particularly vulnerable to these enticements of getting drawn into the past and, and, uh, and, live, and, and sort of just uh, living there. Well, I, I think it's, in, in some ways, it is, it is a good image in the sense that it's the, the image of the pile of files conveys this sense of like um, something absolutely um, looming, which in some ways is going to engulf us. And it's not only piles of files, it's not only a static thing, the fact that the, these piles of files are, are forever getting bigger and bigger and, and bigger, thus creating an, a sense of being engulfed. But I see it rather, um, rather than a vertical metaphor, I would use this, um, maybe this idea of the ocean of, of sound as a, to, to reuse the title of the, the Pixies, um, Pixies songs. But I think you ask what it does to us. Um, and I think what it does in, in some ways is that it paralyzes us because we have the feeling it's it's always going to be here. It's a kind of um, immanence in in some ways, and we're just completely lost in it, and we don't see any kind of um, end to it. And I wonder, and and I wonder, I would be really curious to ask people what it does to them in in terms. It scares me personally because I've got a feeling in some ways it makes me a bit less curious than I used to be. So I did that so I've availability that it's constantly constantly here. It's less of a, of a striving for something. It's, it's a bit easier to find and when things are easier to find, they're just not as attracting, as attractive really. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. It, it changes the dynamic of a relationship to the to the musical world and to and to objects um, from experience. Yeah, I, I would agree, at least to some extent, uh, that that this kind of um, instant accessibility changes our relation to these uh, objects. Uh, but the, I mean, the, within a digital culture, this is not only regarding music; it's mm -hmm. it's regarding everything. And I mean, as, as uh, so scholars, uh, that, that's I mean one, one part of the issue. But I, I you know, I, I, one could turn this issue around to say also that for a younger generation, I mean, this, it's of course uh, 
fantastic the way that they can experience music now. When I, you know, looking at my kids, they can just l listen to Spotify, move on. When I was, when I, you know, I had to read read music lexica regarding this stuff, you know. So, so there's a major difference here. I would say that the, the, the tricky part is, you know, what what to do with this immense pile of files from a more um, societal perspective, thinking about the institutions and thinking about how the ways that we create heritage. So for a number of, 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 or for hundreds of years, we had the legal deposit as a kind of principle for what, what to preserve, mostly regarding publishing and books and then also over to, you know, this, this kind of principle doesn't work at all anymore, even though a number of countries still have their legal deposit law. So we need to come up with new systems that, that are more sort of designed to these kind of new d digital environment, because as a society, we don't need want to become, um, you know, you know, get lost in all this. We, we need to collect something. The, the question is what and, and what kind of, of um, mechanisms that we, but that should rule, rule those kind of structures. And, and on, on this note, I would like to add some things that we've not mentioned, but I think um, should be mentioned is the actual um, environmental cost of uh, digital um, archiving and the actual um, storage, uh, storage costs. And because we're created, on the one hand, we have all this discourse about miniaturization and dematerialization and the disappearance of music objects. But on the other hand, um, dematerialization itself and digitization, they have their own, um, their own environmental material um, cost, which is enormous, and the cost of streaming music is enormous also. And because it disappears, because we don't see it, we think it's, it's fine. And, and then we have all this, uh, all this discourse on, on being environmental friendly and being green and this and that. And, but actually, as we digitize things, we create waves of, of pollution also. Um, yes, but, but Spotify is a bit more environmental friendly than mm -hmm. Netflix. Is, yes. Because moving images are, are you know, heavier. But still. Uh, yeah. Of course. Um, um, before we, uh, tr I try to get away a bit from, I mean, I, I, I of course see the, the, the negative points, the critical points here, but I, in a second I would try to move away a bit from us all middle-aged people trying to be all critical about this, you know, like this being overwhelmed by the endless possibilities. But before I come to that, I would just wanted to ask you, you also did your research on Spotify radio, and I mean, to, yeah, to add true. one more to the negative side, if I understood it right, you found out that, I mean, theoretically, they would have an almost unlimited uh, access or an, an, unlim an, an archival infinity, I think you've called it. But in, in practice, uh, they, they would just use a very small amount of tracks that they would try to present to their listeners. Can you explain so, that a bit? So the background is, this was a couple of years ago when, when the uh, Spotify radio algorithm was fairly popular. So, you know, you, you picked a song and then you could start radio and it will pl play you similar songs. And then the, at, at, on the Spotify community blog, there were a number of critical comments about this algorithm because it really didn't work. This was in sort of third, tw 2013, 14, 15, so a few years back. So we decided in our project to do um, a kind of scientific inquiry into how the Spotify radio algorithm actually worked by using a number of bots, so hundreds of them, and they all started with playing Abbas Dancing Queen, and then we started radio, and then we sort of tracked all the songs that appeared afterwards. And it turned out that after 50 songs or so, and this, the experiment went on for 24 hours. So you imagine a room full of um, uh, Dancing Queen being played. There, there were lots of bots. But after 50 songs or so, up the Dancing Queen came back again. So you would have a kind of loop pattern. Mm -hmm. And then you would have, after 50 songs again, they would come back. And, and the artists in these, in these loops were quite limited. There were only like 15 to 20 different artists. So the, the kind of the claim of Spotify's infinite archive didn't work out at all regarding this, this algorithm. Of course, since they have uh, you know, made, made other ways of, of, of giving us algorithmic choices, but it was also something which was interesting in, in relation to the claims that you know, we have everything and we can play you music basically until you die. Well, this was not the case. Uh -huh. Yeah, interesting. Yes, but I mean, on the other hand, um, um, uh, Melody, uh, as, you, as you said, um, archives used to be fortresses. When you, when you presented this, um, this, this uh, Alain Razné's film essay, uh, All the Memory in the World, 
from the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. Um, that was um, that was a, like a close shop. There, there was a, something. So there was a team of people that decided what to what should be in there. And I mean, even though they still thought that was that's all that's valuable in the world, and we just decide that. And apart from that, everything else is rubbish. And and you also used on the other hand the term elasticity of of digital archives, which is makes them flexible and more open. So is that maybe a, a positive side that you would see in digital archives? Getting away from the fortressness. Yes, yes, I think de definitely. But but we've gone as it were the other extreme from from the fortress to the to the wasteland really. Um, so what I think, I mean, with the, with the with the archive within the library, we always had a kind of um, of catalog. And, and with the internet, we have a crisis of the, of the catalog in, in some ways. I mean, we have obviously um, all the search engines and so on and so forth, and, and you have all these, these keywords. Um, and, and yet, it's, well, it's as you identified, it's this ceaselessness and relentlessness, which is, which is the, the issue. It's elastic, but elastic to the point where it will never break, or will it break? This is um, this is a question. So, on top of this crisis of the catalog, we also have this. What maybe we could we could speak about the crisis of the filter. Mm -hmm. What is what is an archive? What how do we negotiate this? And I think you're quite right when you said we need a new a new term. What what is it? Just maybe YouTube is not an archive. Maybe Spotify is not an archive. Probably it's just more a data collection. Yeah, or, or commercial companies. Or commercial companies, yeah. yes. It's about money. Well, uh, I think uh, Derrida has a word in, in Archive Fever. Uh, he uses the word anarchive, like you know, anarch a pun on anarchy and mm. archive. Ar archive, the word arc, arc, the word arc in archive is the same arc in monarchy, or um, so it has that meaning of order. Uh, to it as well, so yeah, it's a dis it's a disorder, and then then you have to sort of uh, yeah, if it's a if it's a sort of crazy ocean, then you have to n navigate it somehow, and, and um, I think that's why there's, there's there is a sort of demand, uh, f like there's a kind of a boom for books, uh, music books, like books about music and histories of music, and that's what people are wanting is is uh, sort of pathways, making sense of things. Um, one of the, you know, it's not uh, one of the, it's sort of a little off topic, but one of the things, if you're a, a writer about music or a music historian, one of the things the internet done is it's, uh, it's made over research almost compulsive. So, um, for instance, I might be writing, say I was writing like a 500 or 1,000 word uh, record review. I could easily assemble for myself a 50 pages of, of research on this band. Uh, uh, every interview they did, um, you know, it, it's all out there. And it's very different from how I would have written in the 80s when I started, where I would have nothing. I would have, like, a press release, which I probably wouldn't bother to read, and maybe I'd remember a few scraps of information from a music, music interviews that I'd read in another paper or something. Uh, I worked for Melody Maker. I might have... I remember a tiny scrap, but I probably wouldn't have cut out those pieces. So it was all, you know, misremembered things in my head. So I would approach uh, writing a record review as a, uh, as really, it was much more of a creative act. I would imagine, I sort of imagine the record and fictionalize it, and I would recruit it to my particular campaigns and schemes I had at that time, my critical agenda, uh, knowing very little about the intent of the band. Or, or what um, what they were trying to do, you know, or where, you know, even where they came from necessarily. Um, and but now, now, uh, now it's the opposite. Now you know everything that the band is trying to do, and all their influences are plotted out. So it's a, it's um, on the one hand you're writing something that's more, way more accurate than what music journalism used to be in the, especially in the UK. Uh, but you've lost a bit of that creative thing. Mm. And then I find when I do a um, I just, um, both in my own work and sometimes people, uh, just the other day, someone contacted me about a project they were doing um, on my, my Bloody Valentine. And, 
you know, wanted to, someone wanted to do the definitive book on My Bloody Valentine and Kevin Shields, and he mentioned that he'd assembled like something like 350 interviews with Kevin Shields and like ev every video that was available, and and like it was like, I said I said to him, well now you've got the, the joyous job of throwing nearly all of that away, you've assembled all this stuff, and and the task now if you're a writer is to just uh, get rid of all this stuff you spent weeks or whatever, however long. Actually, it doesn't take weeks because you can just drag it all off the internet in, in a little while. But you know, then you have to go through it and, and order it and make a narrative out of it, and that's um, you know that that's challenging. But I mean, uh, just to try to get back again to the positive side, second try. Uh, I'm st I'm still uh, sure. <laughs> I'm still sure that 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 the that the that the that the now really young generation, like teenagers now, um, starting to getting get into their own music, they will manage somehow. So how do you how do your kids do? I mean, of course they have you as a, as a father, so it must be a hard job for them to find something. But I mean, just to you know, like, I, I'm sure there's a way that people would would deal with with that with that piles of uh, files that are threatening them and maybe do the same thing just kick it all away and just do something and you know not care about the, the this gigantic offer you, you said that is kind of calcifying the music mm. you, you once used that term yeah. um yeah i mean i think i think uh there's uh, certainly you're looking at my son he's very excited about music i think a lot of it is like like it's to do with like speed it's like you know you as soon as a mixtape's out or a new track release or whatever having an opinion on it instantly hearing it the second it comes out it's it's much more accelerated i mean we you know you were keen to hear the the new album by the smiths or whatever as soon as you could but um but then there's a kind of moving on very quickly i think and and uh so it's a it's a it's it's still a passionate response to music but i don't it has a different kind of has a more feverish Kind of quality, um, and and uh, and then sort of, um, I think there's also a lot of like listening to the past as well, like listening to, trying to sort of quickly do the whole history of music, uh, and sort of jumping from trying to do the Beatles in one one go to you know something completely different. So it, it you know I, th I think I think uh, there's still obviously. Uh, Young people uh, have this uh, intense discovery of music, um, but I think there's a bit more of um, a less of you know when when things cost money, um, it forced you almost to sort of you know spend a lot of time getting into the depths of them. And now there's a bit more sense of like trying to cover the whole field, I think, and sort of uh, mm -hmm. hear it all somehow in a mad rush. But I think, I think, I mean, on the one hand, we can agree that, okay, so we're in a new situation, we have an infinite archive, et cetera, et cetera. But if you move over to other modalities, say, say books, for instance, you would have had lab libraries for hundreds of years, which were, you know, public ones where you could actually go and browse, et cetera. It's, it's, it's not really the same, but it's sort of. So I, I think also that one should be a bit careful about sort of s s stressing the situation as really something which is dramatically new. I mean, the, the, the sense of information overload goes back to the Middle Ages, has been there you know, for almost for every media that was introduced. Um, I, I think it's very hard to say actually how young people, if we take them, you know, respond to this uh, today. I mean, it's, it's probably more, uh, more individual. I mean, as stated before, I'm more concerned about the way that we actually manage systems that we could keep some of it because at the moment we are not. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, Spotify or Netflix are not archives, they are com commercial companies. Uh, you should uh, cooperate with them because they ease access to uh, your, your holdings if you're an institution, but you, can, you cannot trust them in the long run. I, I, fi I find that a very interesting point because just in these days in, in Germany and I guess elsewhere as well, there have been these demonstrations against these upload filters. And it's an interesting point because people are treating these privately owned US based companies like a state utility you know like they, they're treating them like they, they have a right to have access to all the information and to it's upload a, everything it's there a I mean, common infrastructure yeah. yes it's, uh, and it's not it's it's a privately owned um, thing so they can decide whatever they want so 
and, and, and that's an interesting thing. So you cannot trust, as you said, these these companies because I mean they can close well, down tomorrow. But you could also, I think, you could also turn the issue around again to say that okay, you cannot trust them. But if you know, if YouTube would go away or or Google, you know, there would be something similar that would come along. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like someone will just shut off the internet. Yeah. Yeah. It, we will have it for a number of years. Yeah, but, but you don't, as a citizen, you don't have a right to you know have access to the information. Uh, Simon, you said that, um, and, and, and that's also one, one point that, that, that I think has changed you from the Middle Ages to now. At least when there were hundreds and thousands of books in the library, at least you had to go there with an intent to find that book or just to you know, like find something. Now it comes to your house like a utility, like gas and water and, and the, the music. And I mean, that really changes something in your, uh, as you said, as scarcity makes it interesting for us to, 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 to work with it or to take care of it. I think you know you you can sort of use the internet and create a kind of um, almost surrogates for these older modes of things. So I sometimes use YouTube almost a bit like I would would have gone to a, you know I still I still you know occasionally go to a record store, but like like how I used to uh, before the internet, where 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 you just um, you it's almost a bit like flicking through the racks and you're just amazed at how much. Weird prog rock came out in the seventies, and 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 you so you can sort of create a kind of surrogate for it, and you can even create a surrogate of um, uh, of buying the record by you know downloading an image of the cover uh, and then stripping the audio off the you know YouTube, uh, which I do compulsively, and then never listen to these things ever again uh, in this sort of vestigial. I must own it in some way, or at least keep it. Um, so that's a sort of surrogate. It's like you know, you're you're sitting at home, but you're kind of getting something of that feeling of, of being in the record store and being surprised. You know, all how much strange crap that the record industry put out. And sometimes there are these odd little things that you'll discover. Just, um, but there's a bit. There's I think there's less of a. One of the funny things is there's less of a libidinal payoff because there's something actually about spending money that that. Um, Unless you're extremely wealthy, there is some kind of uh, feeling of parting with something and then getting something, and then that invests the whole process. Whereas if you're going to, uh, what one do I use? Uh, one of those, you know, um, you know, if you're going to Mediafire or if you're going to uh, one of the things that strips the audio off a, a, a YouTube clip, it's it's a very it's only a transaction in in, uh, in terms of spending a little bit, a microsecond of your time, as opposed to your hard-earned money. So, uh, so you get less attached to things. It's a funny thing is that you know the decommodification of music sounds like something you should be uh, in favour of, but actually it's stripped away some of that sort of libidinal buzz of actually looking for things, finding things, and then paying for them. Um, just to pick up on that, I think I think the you know I, I don't have the, the, really the experience of that kind of affection. It, it's for me, it's more on a on a more basic level that w when p when stuff is becoming digital, it moves into the computer, and then you sort of lose track of it. Yeah, that's it, that's, that's something which worries me sometimes, mm -hmm. and and also the way the brain works that you know you really don't remember. Yeah. Prior, I could remember that I had actually bought this CD and it was placed in that place where... Now, yeah. I simply... I, I just forget. That, that's, that's a bit mm. more worrisome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, th having things arrayed around your room uh, in, pi in piles, you know, different kind of piles, actual, literal piles of vinyl, does remind you what you've bought, what you still need to listen to, you know, and... Uh, and the fact that you paid money for it is a sort of uh, encourages you to go back to it and actually extract value from it. Uh, whereas, yes, it's very it's just so easy just you know to forget what you've uh, acquired or where you've been on 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 the internet that day. Yeah. Yeah. Just wanted to add one word, and what's quite interesting in also is that the. Uh, so kind of the, the digital has reinitiated a new cult for objects also, and a new kind of uh, fetishism, which I think is completely linked. And with hyper-digitization, people, um, and you mentioned this sense of, 
of ownership and this sense of having um, tangible objects. And it's uh, Walter Benjamin who was a great collector who said that possession of something might be the most uh, intimate link that you can form um, with, with a thing. And, and that's why I think we have all this new fetish and new vinyls and, and cassettes and, and record shops are packed with them. I mean, no, the point is still to ask who actually listens because they always come up with a download code also. And it's, but still, there is a, I mean, it's a mixture of the, the physical and, and the digital, but we create new objects. And it's not simply a kind of, I, I don't think it is simply that people want to to consume and to, to spend money, but it's most that as human beings, we are still completely and fully uh, embodied and still living in a material world. And we, we still have the, the need to engage um, with things on a, on a kind of multi-sensory uh, mode as well. And, and not only digitally, it's frustrating. It's only, it's only the audio, only the, the visual, but there's still something to well, as, as a critic say, to have and, and to, to hold also. Yeah. I think that's quite important to, yeah. to mention. Uh, I think it's almost, it's almost like, uh, like the buying it on, uh, on vinyl is like commemorating a relationship with it. And if you really like it, you kind of, uh, mm. you want to have that tangible mark of it. I actually remember doing that a bit uh, as a, uh, back when I was a teenager. It's like sometimes you would buy a single that you'd heard a lot on the radio and loved. Mm. And in practice, you wouldn't actually play the single that much. But it was sort of a marker of, uh, of the fact that you just loved this single. Um, and so it had that same kind of tangibilization of this radio relationship. But, but, but again, to sort of make things a bit complicated, you know, there, there has been a kind of tr uh, uh, a non-tangible relation to media for quite some time. You know, think about radio or, or television for that matter. There are no sort of real objects. It's more about the situations where you see or listen to things. Mm. But um, at, at least for me, I, I can't really translate those over into the kind of new digital world. Mm. I, I don't remember anymore when, where I've listened to something or when I watched a film on my screen, yeah. computer screen. It's just... Fuzzy. But I th I, we have to. Uh, I would like to come to the Q and A, but I mean, I, I would just like to add one thing. But I mean, you can see that uh, what you just said um, by the way that computer screens are designed, the 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 the, the, the operating systems, because they're designed after an actual physical desk, so you, it helps you a bit in orientation. And I mean, of course, our brains are have I don't know like five hundred thousand years of you know, like being formed for physical objects. And the same is that when you read stuff on paper, you can remember it better than reading a PDF document and all these things. But still, I mean, to end on a positive note, I would still. Just hint again at these all these new. I mean, there's so much new and interesting music coming out in all at pe parts of the world by people who have just now access to music from everywhere else, and they get inspired. I mean, sometimes they get overwhelmed. You can hear it in the music, so it's kind of this neurotic. I try, try to scram all the styles in the world in my track kind of music. I guess you know what I'm talking about. So it's like it's it's this weird things but still I mean there's so many young people doing interesting stuff just because of all this that we've just criticized so there's a, there's also a, a positive side to it yeah. okay but um, I would like to open this panel now for the last 15 minutes for Q&A from the audience so um, if there's any questions from the audience please raise your hands we have a microphone available this one there Hi, thanks for the discussion. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about the ways in which we try to navigate the piles of files because um, back in the day, so to speak, there were various gatekeepers that it might be a magazine or it might be John Peel or later it might be a blogger that you liked. But now I think definitely for me and I, I, I'm guessing probably for a lot of people in the room, it's now the algorithm and um, the YouTube algorithm or Spotify algorithm. And last year um, I like... Uh, like lots of hipsters, I got into Japanese <laughs> ambient music. And this stuff, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know who the producers were. I didn't know who they were influenced by. I knew nothing. It's completely sort of a weightless experience. And the YouTube algorithm is fantastic because you just type in one thing that you've heard of and it takes you down this uh, wormhole and all of a sudden you've discovered this music. For me, I thought the YouTube algorithm gets a bad rap for kind of, you know, forcing, you know, 9-11 truth videos on people, but actually it works quite well for music that you don't know very much about. But on the other hand, it's completely impersonal, 
we don't know the kind of the alchemy of we don't know the way it works. We don't know who constructs its, who constructs its formulas or what rules they're built according to. And so I wonder if that's something that we should worry about. If that changes that if the nature if the changing nature of the gatekeeper is something that we should think about when we're trying to navigate our piles of files. Well, you're absolutely right, and, and yes, we should think about that. And, and yes, we we simply don't know how the YouTube uh, recommendation algorithm works. It's you know, and and it's also a very big problem, of course, both for scholars and, and journalists that we're not able to do these kind of investigations into how these things work. The stuff that we've been doing with Spotify, with working with our bots, uh, we've of course been been forced to break terms of service. Otherwise, we can't do anything. And they, uh, Spotify, actually tried to sue us, um, threatening to to take away our funding from the Swedish Research Council. So that I think is is also an important issue in trying more to understand how these systems actually work. And in in, in the long run, I would say that it's, it's a polit political issue, like the demonstrations uh, today. It's funny. I've, I've, I've use Spotify quite a lot, but I've never actually s surrendered to the algorithm. I'm always very purposeful in my, as I, I'm always looking for something specific to hear, or I'm building one of these playlists that I never actually listen to. <laughs> and, um, but I, th I think I should try it, because it's clearly, obviously, a thing that a lot of people do. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really let YouTube steer me either. Like, I, like it will carry, you know, if I'm distracted, it'll carry on playing something. It seems to play things I've already played, which sort of makes me feel like I'm in ever decreasing circles and you know, uh, sort of traps within my own taste. Uh, but I usually I, I override it and kind of uh, uh, I will sort of uh, you know explore the things in the sidebar where, where there are things that it thinks are compatible with what I'm looking for. And sometimes it's it misunderstands me. It doesn't seem to quite understand uh, how my m mind works, <laughs> but throws up puzzling things that I'll check out. But I, yeah, I haven't I haven't really. Uh, embrace the algorithm, but it, I think it's. I think it, I, I suspect it has an effect on a lot of people's listing, where it kind of makes everything a bit. You, you mentioned the Japanese ambient, ambient stuff, which is fantastic. I think it probably makes everything a bit like that, doesn't it? It makes everything more of an ambient kind of Muzak background thing, because um, you know you're, you're you're sort of letting go of the steering wheel or the tiller, you know, and letting something else navigate for you, and and. And, and sort of letting your consciousness be partially occupied by other things. So then every, music slips back from a foreground to a background thing. So there does seem to be a sort of uh, an ambientization of, of music and ambient music itself is, is sort of really huge again. Uh, and there's been all this interest in New Age and the Japanese stuff you mentioned. And, um, and even, our thing, even things like trap or UK drill music are quite ambient, you know, you just sort of immerse yourself in it and play a lot of very samey sounding tracks that are just different enough uh, to, to, to not bore you to death, but um, it, it seems to be a thing that's happening, uh, this backgrounding thing. Yes, and Anton, you were asking so about how we navigate these um, these piles, and um, I think it's quite also I think it's quite interesting the examples that that you gave with with YouTube, and I assume you first needed, um, in some ways, you needed a keyword already to enter YouTube, so you were you you need this, and you can't be exposed to random music. You still. You need to know what you're looking for in some paradoxical sense, even though you only have a very, very uh, vague idea of it. But what's interesting with YouTube is that you don't really, you don't really, if you use the algorithm, you don't really play YouTube, but you, the, the software just plays you in, in some ways. And I think it, whilst collecting also some information about your trajectory and, and so on and so forth, but to, to answer the question of the gatekeepers, I think there are still human beings. And I think there are still like, people who have online um, communities and blogs and so on and so forth who create uh, their own, their own uh, niche in some way. So we have, it's no longer the institution of, of the music um, magazines or of John Peel and the radio, but we, have, we still have people who are ready to, to share and dedicate. And I think, and maybe we've not spoken 
enough about this. It's this notion of there is still um, a community, however, however scattered, I think, and of people who love, uh, who love music who are, and who want to share the knowledge about music, I think. Yeah, we have. Um, I think I've, I've said it in the panel before. We have uh, we have panels on that tomorrow as well, on um, on um, non-institutionalized um, archivists, if you want to call it that, and uh, also uh, on um, non-traditional archives like Ubu Web, uh, for example, it's, uh, that, you, that you've mentioned. Um, is there any other question in the audience? Does anybody? It's, there's one here. Hi, um, I think just maybe disconnect to the other question and some comments. Um, I hear several times the reference to free music. Uh, I don't think there is anything like free music. Um, and I wanted to connect to that, to the concept that I hear here in the talk uh, about the utility company. And maybe to the idea of that the uh, algorithm is playing us instead of we play in the algorithm. Can you repeat the question? I, we didn't really get the question. If there is something like free music, really? Free, you mean in the, in the meaning of copyright free or? No, no, free for us to listen. Free. Streaming, if it's really free. Free? Yeah. How would you define free in that, in that sense? That, that we are not paying in some way. I ah, you mean free of cost? Exactly. Then. Okay. Yeah, well, it's like everything else on, online. You pay with your data and your tracks. You, it's always being kept and it's being used in various ways, which we, again, don't really know because we cannot really investigate them. But, um, well, yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's free in a way that... It's, um, sorry. it's free in a way that, you know... Clearly, is different from how it used to be, where you had to go into the Virgin Megastore, or uh, I don't know what the equivalent here is, or H, you know, R, R Price, or HMV in the UK, and uh, Tower Records, and, and hand over cash to hear the music, unless you ta you know you could tape it off the radio, uh, maybe. But um, so it's free in that sense, you know. But yeah, the, um, uh, you have to. You're, you're paying for electricity, I suppose, and you're paying um, whatever your fee is to access the internet. And uh, then there are the annoying adverts on uh, on Spotify. So you know, it, um, but it's definitely the case that it um, it's a lot cheaper to be a, a music fan, I think, uh, than it used to be, and that's created this problem of, of a sort of wealth that you know, on the one hand, has some some good qualities. To, you know, a, music, a musical wealth that everyone can enjoy, a common wealth, but also is a kind of uh, a burden or a, a damaging in other ways. You know. um, well, yeah. Well, I mean, musician, musicians don't get paid the way, the way yeah. they used to. I mean, Spotify pays them ridiculous sums for for being streamed there. Yeah. Okay. There's. Uh, we we can we can take one last question. There was one over there. Yeah. Can we have the microphone over there? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Did I? Okay. It's okay. Excuse me. Then it's two questions. Okay. It's okay. I will be quick. I'm just intrigued to help you find the optimist route okay. with the combination of personas you have up there. Because uh, I don't want to fall for assumptions, but one is a skeptic uh, optimist, the other one could be a sarcastic realist, and the other one is. Um, optimistic nihilist. <laughs> I like you and I'm very curious Who's because <laughs> um, yeah, we, we all have one, one, one common problem, um, the curse of knowledge and it, uh, it's very risky because we become critical with, uh, with new things, with mutations in society, in life, in science, in arts, in everything. And I like the point Mr. Sneakers made about uh, over-information has been happening over many years now. And the problem is not the amount of information and not even the archiving of it, but how we 
end up perceiving it. So maybe we, maybe we should just have to research on new ways of navigating it in our own head and um, finding a way to approach it differently, a little bit more humorous or sarcastic or even with YouTube. I call the sidebar DJ sidebar because honestly, sometimes he's good. He's better than me. And uh, be critical, but still um, find a purpose in this whole over information because uh, cultural heritage is very important for all of us. So it's good. It, it will not, it's not a ticking bomb. I don't feel that it is a ticking bomb. It's, yeah. And I, want, I wanted to ask you, uh, do you think that, uh, is there being research on the wrong direction, maybe? Who are you asking now? Uh, All of them. All of you, yeah. <laughs> I, th I think, that, I mean, you're right. I think there is a, uh, one should try to sort of understand uh, how this new situation is is going to be handled and that you are you, on the one hand you can trust that you don't need to download all your stuff because they are around there and if you look at the kids they are they're not doing that on the other hand you know it's it's not a hundred percent trust we all know this because there are things happening all the time suddenly facebook changes its algorithm and you can't really do that so there's always this kind of glitch of 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 um where the trust sort of is not really there. And I think that is something that we need to sort of work on, um, all of us, basically. Yeah. Okay, thanks. There's so the last question over there. Hi. Um, I would be interesting a bit to, to learn from you what's your opinion on, um, on how streaming services are influencing the process of creation in music. Um, before, b before streaming and well, the, the advent of the internet age and so on, um, there were very few metrics by which uh, musicians could, um, could measure their success in terms of LPs bought, people coming to concerts, um, and so on. But nowadays I have the feeling, or perhaps it's already happening, that there's a bidirectional exchange of communication between listeners and the streaming service that then can collect this data and hands it over back to the music creators and they get to know, for instance, how long people have been listening to a track, when they are playing, uh, when they are pressing next. So they get all this very um, refined information about when a song generates more interest or more excitement um, and whether that could influence then this, um, this process of creation. Well, the, the the stuff that we've been doing on Spotify, we we haven't we don't have any figures. But what what there, there were rumors a number of years ago that uh, uh, following the so-called thirty-second rule, that you get payment after a song has been played for thirty seconds, you could foresee that sh songs would become shorter because that would be a way to to make more money. But you know, I I I don't I can't say if that has happened, and and I'm not a mus musician myself, so I I wouldn't really know. But that that might something might be something that, that is going to, to occur. Yeah. And, and I think this is, well, for now, as you mentioned, we have very, very precise means and all these metrics, and we know exactly who plays what for long and so on and so forth. But um, at least in the, in, the, in the music industry, in the popular music industry, people have always tried to, to create this perfect like commercial hits as well. And you start with a song factories and Tin Pan Ali and so I think it's more a continuation of this and a completely new thing uh, also and, and we can recontextualize and historicize this practice of having a but it's when the song is considered to be this perfect uh, commercial product um, commodified um, but I think it's not necessarily new um. <laughs> I something before we have um, to yeah, close I everything then? Yeah. I, I, I can remember reading, there was, an, there was an article someone did that was all about how there were certain formal properties in pop songs that were becoming accentuated yeah. mm. uh, uh, b precisely to avoid people uh, mm. switching off them. But that, that is, you know, I think the same kind of things went on with radio as well, you know, and, and different radio stations with their playlists are, are, are trying to... Uh, 
they're terrified of someone switching to a different station. So, um, the, in, in any kind of format where um, there's 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 some kind of uh, pressure to uh, homogenize, I think uh, it, it, I don't think it's a uniquely uh, bad trait of Spotify. The main the main thing with streaming seems to be that albums are just enormously long, aren't they? And and that's um, or incre a lot a lot of albums that are like just have 19 tracks. It's sort of gone back to the the early days of the CD when people felt they had to fill every minute on the CD. It's, it's because they get more money for yeah each play. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um. Um, before I, we close everything down, I just wanted to invite you to um, stay because afterwards we have a keynote by the esteemed Joyce Clayton that is called Life and Death in the Universal Library. And um, Jace uh, proposes to consider the archive as a site of sacrifice. So we're all looking forward to listen to this. And thank you, everybody. And uh, yes, enjoy. Thank you.